Whether Timbuktu was founded in the 5th, the 11th, or the 12th century is a matter of contention. Let's see what we can discover about this city that has been shrouded in mystery and debated in the halls of history for quite some time. Timbuktu is a city located in modern-day Mali, located in West Africa. Founded by the Tuareg people, Timbuktu developed into an ancient metropolitan. It was home to state-of-the-art schools, libraries, and mosques, and served as a hub for trade, study, and the arts, sort of like an ancient New York City. As with most historical cities worldwide, very little is known about the earliest years of Timbuktu. In light of recent archaeological discoveries, environmental data, genetics, and language studies, various contradictory hypotheses have popped up in recent years. By piecing together various sources of information, historians have attempted to explain how the once non-existent city just south of the Sahara Desert in modern-day Mali grew to become a mecca of trade, riches, and culture by the 16th century. Some historians believe Timbuktu was founded as early as the 5th century, although the more common thought is that Timbuktu was founded in either the 11th or the 12th century. A nomadic Tuareg woman named something close to Timbuktu's current name probably founded the city. According to some researchers, Timbuktu translates to place covered by small dunes, mother with a large navel, the Well of Waktu, or the Wall of Butu. The Tuaregs, Timbuktu's founders and original inhabitants, are also shrouded in mystery. It is believed that the first mention of the Tuaregs was by the Greek historian Herodotus, who mentioned a people group operating trade routes through the Sahara, living in what is known today as southwest Libya. While these people probably existed as far back as the 5th century BCE, the isolation of the Sahara Desert made it impossible for foreigners to learn more about them. Similar to the history of Timbuktu, most information about the Tuaregs comes from environmental, genetic, and language data. The Tuaregs are probably descendants of an ancient Sahara ethnic group known as the Berbers. The Berbers, whose name originates from the Romans, who used the same name for most indigenous Africans they encountered, are native to northwestern Africa and are said to be descendants of another North African pre-Arab population. Evidence of rock art resembling the Berbers dates to the region's oldest possible dates, some historians believe to be over 100,000 years ago. Sometime later, likely many centuries, if not millennia, after the Saharan Ice Age, a group of the Berbers, who eventually became known as the Tuaregs, developed a distinct culture. They began to spread out throughout the Sahara. In the first century, the Tuaregs spread in all directions eventually making the over 3,700-mile trek to northwestern Africa to the region where Timbuktu is located. Some people believe the Arabs introduced the term Tuareg, abandoned by God in Arabic, when they failed to convert the Africans. However, historians agree that the city was founded sometime between the year 0 and the year 1100. Since northern, western, and southern Africa could easily access Timbuktu without having to traverse thousands of miles of the Sahara Desert, Timbuktu became a trading post. In the following years, the city transformed into a hub of spreading ideologies, most notably Islam. Although the earliest proof points to the 13th century, the proliferation of religious doctrines likely occurred in Timbuktu years before. By the 1200s, Muslim texts were exchanged in the trading city, as were other written and spoken teachings of Islam, such as medicine, law, mathematics, and more. The historical mentions of Timbuktu start to form a relatively more detailed picture around the 13th century. One of the primary reasons for this change was the increased influence of the Mali Empire in the region. In the early 13th century, King Sumangaru, a vicious and violent emperor mentioned in epic poems of the time, took over much of West Africa. Sumangaru was hungry for more land and power and spent most of his rule attempting to conquer states throughout the Ghana Empire. He finally captured the capital of the Ghana Empire, Kumbi, in 1203. During his killing spree, he also destroyed a town named Niani, located in the Malinke Kingdom of Kangaba, and killed the entire royal family, except for a sickly boy. Sundiata Keita, the surviving royal boy, gained favor amongst his people and began organizing a private army to take on Samangaru's oppressive rule. After defeating Samangaru, Sundiata quickly consolidated and unified a number of the small Malinke kingdoms, forming what would become known as the Mali Empire. Niani was chosen as the capital city of the Mali Empire, probably because it was the birthplace of its founder. 
Miani's fertile soils and proximity to the rivers propelled the growth and success of the budding Mali Empire. Although King Sundiata, unlike his predecessor, was not known for conquering, in 1240 he seized the city of Kumbi, the old capital of the Ghana Empire. The Mali Empire was already prospering due to its agricultural exploits. Still, by seizing what remained of the Ghana Empire, Sundiata gained their salt and gold reserves, further driving the newly formed empire's growth. Although historians know very little about Sundiata's rule, he established systems that would inspire future leaders of the Mali Empire. The Mali Empire continued to prosper after Sundiata's rule. Different monarchs came and went. By the 1300s, almost half of the world's gold was sourced from gold mines in the Mali Empire. While gold still held an almost equal value to salt in North Africa, in the South, where salt was rare but a fundamental part of the people's diet, salt was worth far more than gold. Salt, abundant in the north, was traded with the southern regions of Africa, and just like gold, all of the salt that passed in or out of the Mali Empire was heavily taxed, increasing the empire's wealth exponentially. The empire also boasted an army of 100,000 soldiers. The Mali Empire was already a major empire of the African continent, but the rule of Mansa Musa elevated it to the realm of legends. With the vague oral histories of the Mali Empire, it is not known for sure what land was acquired by which king. However, by the time Musa became the Mansa, the Mali Empire had five significant cities – Niani, Kuombi, Sala, Gao, Jene, and of course, Timbuktu. Regardless of the exact number of people in Timbuktu at the time, when Mansa Musa took his throne, Timbuktu was already an urban hub. It attracted visitors and settlers from all over the world, but its growth was only beginning. Musa may have acquired Timbuktu, but even if he did not, he was the one who turned Timbuktu into a central hub. The five major cities of the Mali Empire formed the Trans-Saharan trade routes, still recognized as one of classical society's most fundamental trade routes. Just as the previous Mansas had done, Musa implemented strict taxation upon all who crossed the Mali Empire. And seeing as the Trans-Saharan routes went through the Mali Empire and many of its large cities, it is no surprise that Musa is considered one of the wealthiest men in history. One of the most well-known stories about Mansa Musa is about his Hajj. While Musa's Hajj put him and his empire on the map, historians believe that it was still about religion for him. Due to the increase in Islamic libraries, schools, and monuments, the Mali Empire began attracting Muslims. This was especially true in Timbuktu, which became known as the true heart of Islamic studies in the Mali Empire. The construction of the University of Sankore, which had more than 25,000 students enrolled at its peak, furthered students' arrival. Additionally, the Islamic library in Timbuktu became undoubtedly the best library for not only Islamic resources, but also all studies in the whole of Africa. After the opening of the University of Sankore, Timbuktu would attract Muslim scholars from other regions in Africa, the Middle East, Asia, and Europe. Timbuktu would also be home to the Jinjurubur Mosque, another well-known learning and religious center. It attracted thousands of Islamic students. Built in 1327, the Jinjurubur Mosque remained active for nearly 500 years and still stands today. After Musa's rule, the empire faced several issues. His successor, Mansa Suleiman, had to deal with family intrigue, external foes, rebellions, and the Black Death. He barely managed to keep the empire and its economy stable. But in the latter part of the 14th century, after Suleiman's reign, things went from bad to worse. The Masi Empire emerged as a formidable foe in the 15th century. The Songhai people had inhabited the territory of their would-be empire for quite a long time but the Mali Empire had captured them around 1325. Around the 1360s and 1370s, they reclaimed their capital city, Gao, and formed an empire known as the Songhai Empire. As the Mali Empire's economy struggled and dwindled, internal and external factors destabilized it. With growing dissatisfaction among the population, much of the Mali Empire was raided by external and internal forces. Though Timbuktu and its surrounding areas changed drastically between the 5th century, when the Tuareg supposedly ran it, and the 14th century, when it was part of the Mali Empire, its original people remained. The Tuareg people established the region's first trade routes, trade cities, and gold and salt mines. While they were probably treated better than some native populations due to their valuable knowledge of the Saharan conditions, they were not satisfied. 
Over the 14th century, the Tuaregs constantly waged wars, rebellions, and revolts, attempting to reclaim their land. However, in the latter years of the 14th century, the Tuareg population changed their rebellion style, especially in Timbuktu. Instead of revolting violently, they began appropriating tax money rather than sending it to Mansa Musa II or his administration. The Mali Empire had weakened, and the Tuareg people took advantage of the situation. In 1430, after decades of battle, the Tuareg people managed to defeat the endless men sent by the Mali Empire and successfully win back Timbuktu. Unfortunately, they could not hold on to it for long. The Portuguese had begun their colonialist excursions, and the Mali Empire was distracted. The Songhai Empire used the distraction to claim Timbuktu. The Songhai took over Niani shortly afterward. Although there were trade cities throughout the Songhai Empire, including the great city of Gao, Timbuktu had once again become a favorite stop for travelers. And with its advanced libraries, schools, and mosques, it once again became home to some of the 16th century's most outstanding scholars and artists. In the late 16th century, the Moroccans conquered Timbuktu and forced the collapse of the Songhai Empire. Scholars or merchants did not want to visit the city under an aggressive government. The city fell into a steady decline. Throughout the entirety of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, Timbuktu would pass between the hands of various smaller governments, none of which could hold on to the city. This changing of guards transformed Timbuktu into more of a battleground than a livable city. In the 19th century, a few chance visits to Timbuktu sparked European interest in the city and its surroundings. Over the latter years of the 19th century, Morocco's territory was slowly divided, and in 1894, France officially conquered and seized Timbuktu. Under French control, Timbuktu continued to diminish. While France invested some funds into restoring the once great city, the renovations went unfinished. So, even though it was still inhabited, Timbuktu resembled ancient ruins rather than an inhabited city. The newly formed Republic of Mali acquired Timbuktu after the Second World War. The Tuareg peoples, still living in the Republic of Mali, both in and outside of Timbuktu, did not want to be under a non-Tuareg leader, so they launched a failed revolt. Since then, the Republic of Mali and the city of Timbuktu have been victims of consistent political destabilization. Between armed Islamist groups and armed political rebellions, the city of Timbuktu has been mostly destroyed. Regardless of the city's future, most of Timbuktu's sacred items are being exported as people fear their destruction. Books and incredible art from the reign of Mansa Musa have been collected. It is hopeful that everything with historical value, short of the iconic structures themselves, will gradually be removed from the dangerous city. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history? Impress your friends and predict the future more accurately based on past events. If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about Timbuktu, check out our book, Timbuktu, a captivating guide to an important ancient city and how it became a part of the wealthy Mali Empire during the reign of Mansa Musa. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.